Hi, it's Janie Pendleton and we are back. Um, today we are talking about the book that I wrote, The Gates to Love and War. I wrote this back in 2008 and uh, we talked about it on the last video on our daily devotional. But a few of you found me out when you were Google searching me and asked me if I was the author. Um, somebody asked me if I would read some excerpts from my book and I said that I would be happy to do it. And uh, you can see here the cover, The Gates to Love and War. You can buy this at Amazon, so if you want to get a copy of this, you can. Um, I've written 13 novels. This is my first. And um, this is the only one, uh, besides my cookbooks, this is the only novel novel that I have out, that's out right now. And it is a series, and I will try to come out with the uh, the other two uh, the other two books in that series. But anyway, I hope this sun's not on you too much there. Do I need to move you a little bit? <laughs> but anyway, um, the Gates to Love and War you can pick it up at Amazon.com. I think it's selling for like seven dollars a book, seven ninety nine or something like that. And you used to be able to get it at Target and Walmart and a few other places, Barnes and Noble, places like that. But I don't think, I mean, obviously that was in 2008, so I'm pretty sure only Amazon, and I think maybe Target, but I think mostly Amazon sells it now, so, um, and that's only online. It's been eight years ago, okay? <laughs> now this is a new one, I've not read it yet. I don't know where my original, I've got the original book to it. And like I said, they got construction going all the way around me right now. I got four, five, six, seven houses going up. So seven houses going up around us right now. So, ah. All right. So the first thing I just want to say is this work is a fiction. All names and characters in this novel are product of my imagination. I'm the author. Some institutions, places, and events in this novel, however, are real. But the political views and the administrative settings are not meant to represent the actual policies of any known institutions. U.S. military, U.S. Forest Service, or any law enforcement agency of its kind. Okay, so, with that having been said, I would like to, de I dedicated this book to, um, in loving memory of my best friend, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Heflin, pilot of the U.S. Air Force. He served this nation with seven tours of duty. Fly high until we meet again, friend. In addition, in loving memory of all the sung and unsung heroes who have fallen for or stood proud to serve this nation. Moreover, to the many others who safeguard and protect our rights to a free society and for those who serve the flag of unity and protect the bell of freedom, so that it may ring forevermore in the hearts and in the ears of those who would try to put us under their heavy laden boot of tyranny. I personally thank you, Jane Pendleton. That's me. And that's my dedication page. And then I also want to give a special thanks and dedication to my husband, uh, First Class Sergeant John Thomas Pendleton of the U.S. Army. And then I wrote a little letter to my husband. It says, John is so supportive and loving. An answer to my prayers. I am not sure I have ever been more impressed by any one human. John is so intelligent and dedicated in saving lives and teaching others to save lives. You are wondrous and I thank you deeply for your inspiration and support. A BB, which is my nickname. John named me back when he was in Iraq, when we met in Iraq. Um, in addition, a special thanks to my dear friend, Staff Sergeant Holly Hogan of the U.S. Air Force. Holly works in Montana, at, well she worked at that time, in Montana as a U.S. Forest Service Ranger during the warm seasons. She is on the wheat crew and the fire crew when things get hot in Spotted Bear uh, Ranger District. She also serves in the U.S. Air Force Reserves, well she used to, I think she retired, in the law enforcement sector. Holly is an inspiration to all women and a great friend. I wrote this bit, book in part for UH Squared. I hope you love Montana Big Sky Country and its spectacular mountains. Thanks for the support, fun, and your undying dedication to serve our country. Big Sis. All right. And then you have your, um, your table of contents. And there are 20 chapters in this book. And the first one... Uh, now this is the original book. Remember, I rewrote it, so I actually have about three or four chapters prior to this now that are written 
Matter of fact, she even has a dog now in the new version. She doesn't have a dog, but in the new version, she has a dog named Oliver. It gives more of her Indian uh, heritage background and uh, why she had to come back from the Iraq War. And um, uh, the book I've got coming out has more of a background. But um, I changed it enough, you probably would want to read both of them. So go ahead and get a copy of this one and read it. And then you can tell me the comparison of book two and let me know what you think. Uh, of what you think of the changes, but um, but this 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 went global. This book went global almost. Mm, I would say probably within 60 days, two months of the um, of it initially coming out. So chapter one: Never judge a book by its cover. Okay, that's my chapter one. I might have to go somewhere else because of the hammering. I hope that doesn't bother you too much. The sultry days had not long passed here in the northwestern part of Montana, where I lived alone on a small 1,200-acre ranch nestled high on a 2,700-foot uh, elevated plateau. Sitting on the western edge of the spectacular Swan Mountain Range, my land shared a border with the Flathead National Forest. The view in any direction was a beautiful mountainscape trailing as far as the eye could see. The enormous, rolling green mounds of the Swan Range gave way to a much larger backdrop of the vast stony peaks of Glacier National Park, where the snow-capped summits soared high into the big blue sky. Carved deep into the western canyons below my highlands was a grand river, and it flowed freely with immense power. I could hear it rushing wildly across its water-smoothed rocks in the valley below, especially after an intense rain or a heavy melting snow. Several smaller creeks and ponds throughout these dense mountains fed this snaking river. One of these larger creeks ran through the center of my farmstead and nourished my cattle and horses whenever I set them out to pasture. The ranch itself was small, but the property was large. Around 200 acres of my ranch was tillable, fertile land that I rotated in crops each year. This year I had planted winter wheat, as next year barley looked like a good bet financially. The rest of my territory was not arable, means it wasn't tillable, it wasn't plantable land, and was solely unviable forest and streams, yet its beauty was priceless. It was about a 20 minute drive south from the nearest town to reach my road. Then another 20 minutes up a fairly steep incline to reach my property. Two hours away if you were hiking or on the local numbered trails or on horseback. I rarely got any visitors here so my solitude was ensured. And I liked it that way. It made me feel safer keeping my distance from society. Occasionally, the avid angler would saunter through my neck of the woods, you know, a fisherman, <laughs> in search of that perfect fishing hole, or a hiker wanting to see the endearing views from my side of the mountain. But for the most part, those were rare occasions. Here at Garden Gate Ranch, the growing season was in a colder climate. Therefore, it usually only lasted from late May to around early September if I was lucky. It was still early in the fall season and my mother's cold hardy perennials were still showing some signs of life. The uneventful rainy season this summer had long passed and the thirst ridden pines had shed their dry needles earlier than usual, leaving the earth's bed with a thick layer of kindling just waiting for the right moment in time. A moment that could cause acres of dry bush and brush to burn for weeks. Each year Montana lost thousands of acres of forest land to these fires. And this year had been particularly dry. I could still see the remnants of some of those larger fires still smoldering behind the distant mountain caps to the east. You could still see the smoke coming off some of the forest fires in the distance. It was hard to watch such spectacular beauty burn. And on a clear day, I could see the smoke rising like a great white plume in the distant ranges. 
The most I could do from here was to watch the situation and enjoy the otherwise wondrous views from my ranch's plateau. I could only pray for the safety of the forest and the fire rangers and hope that the rains or snows that plagued our state would come to stifle the fire's fury soon. You know, it was very dry out, so they have, were having forest fires, and that was true for that year. They were battling a lot of forest fires in 2008. After inhaling a long, pine-scented breath and releasing it, I began my daily chores, which would take most of my morning and afternoon. I awoke early to bake my favorite sourdough bread and to can the last of, of this year's green beans. Then I headed to my garden, which I tended any day I could fit it in, as well as tending two roguish horses, one weary trail mule, and 50 head of Angus daily. And by the way, I changed that to buffalo in the second book. Uh, during the summer months, I hired a local hand to help me. However, with the fast approaching winter weather, he had decided to go back to his family farm leaving me to my own thoughts and that wonderful feeling of solitude once again. Of course, I was never truly alone as there were plenty of wild elk, moose, mule deer, mountain goats, and the occasional bear family passing through to keep me company. I would see them in the early morning mist, roaming my meadows and often feeding on my crops. The horses would immediately let me know if bears were close by. Sometimes, I could hear their sounds, sounds that came screaming down the mountainside, usually near dusk. I never wandered too far from the house without a shotgun of some sort, as the bears could be just as quiet as they were loud. Heading to the watershed, I filled my watering can from the rusty old pump that stood nearby, and then made my way down the garden's narrow path. Of course, I was full of intentions of finishing its winter prep by supper time. Nevertheless, I knew they were only intentions, as work in the garden is never truly completed. See, when I write my books, I put my hobbies in here, and I love to garden, and this story was about a spunky little redhead, Marine, and so I wanted my personality to come out in the book. They say you're not supposed to write your character as you in the book. But in this book, I decided in my first book, I wanted me to be the character, so to speak, in a certain way. And by the way, the, her the hero's name in this book is John, but I did not, I had not met my husband John yet when I wrote this book. I didn't know him. I could see that my black-eyed Susans and purple coneflowers had pushed forward their last blooms of the early fall season. Reaching out with my cutters, I nipped off most of their dried pods hoping this would keep the seedlings healthy for next spring. Then I spread a layer of straw around their bases to keep their roots safe from the harsh winter, which I was sure would reach my side of the mountain before long. I worked throughout the morning until I could see down the old brick pathways, where my wheelbarrow sat among my now second season blooming cornflowers. At least I still had these and the wild sunflowers to keep my eyes full. That was until the first freeze came. I grabbed the old wheelbarrow and headed further down the path. It was an old brick laid path with dry moss growing between each paver. I could still remember my father laying each brick in the fresh sand, leveling it with his grandfather's level and a two by four. Pulling weeds and hoeing between each plant, I remembered more of the time when my father had laid the path. I had only been six years old, but I still vividly remember that day. I had been playing around the sand pile when I tripped and fell over one of the deep red paving bricks. I thought my father would be furious with me, as he certainly was known for his Irish, red-headed temper. After all, I had gotten hurt playing where he had just asked me not to play. Instead of responding in rage, however, he surprisingly ran over to me picked me up with a face of worry and carried me to the old pump house where he cleaned the blood from my knee with his handkerchief, which he soaked in the chilled water of the old well. He dried my tears and kissed my knee, saying in his strong Irish accent, 
There, there now, me sweet lassie. You mustn't cry so. The big girls don't cry if they're going to be papa's a brave soldiers. Of course, that comment would dry me up immediately, and he knew it all too well. Now I looked down at my knee, which was still bore the small scar from that fall so many years ago. I touched it lightly with one of my dirty, gloved hands, and took another deep breath of the fall-cooled breezes that were now winding their way up from the mountainous ravines below me. In the air I could smell the faint possibility of rain, a rain I had been praying for all summer. The ground was so dry it was cracking, and the creek that fed my animals was dropping daily. Catching every little breeze as well were the large weeping willows that lined the edge of the old still covered bridge that crossed my section of Crooked Creek. Unless you were on horseback or hiking, it was the only accessible road to my place in the mountains. I could see the willows long bowed branches swaying in each gust, giving off a soft thrashing sound. They looked as though they were dancing in their own ballet recital. My own little theater stage was set before me, and I was determined to enjoy this season's last show. I raised myself higher to peek over the scented pine forest beyond the willows. And I decided that it definitely looked like rain. A rain would probably arrive later in the evening, although even I found it hard to predict the weather this time of year, especially in these mountains. Either way, I was prepared for its fast-changing fury. One day it would still be warm as a hot summer day and the next freezing cold arctic rain or even a dusting of snow would blow down from the higher mountain ranges. The storms of this fast approaching season brought in all kinds of mystic weather and I was more than ready for its blast. Garden vegetables were canned and put away safely in the cellar for warm winter meals and I had made my annual visit to Creston the small village north of me in the valley, along with a visit to the much larger city of Kalispell. I had gone to buy farm supplies and stock my own pantry as well. Plenty of wood was chopped and at the ready, and I had already stored away the summer fire sprinklers the day before. And then I added the heater to the well pump, just as my father had done the many years before me. This will keep me alive until spring thaw, I thought to myself as I pushed forward, working my way to the next raised bed of earth. Being truly prepared left me relaxed in thought, knowing that I was ready for another long winter in big sky country. All year long I can remember how my parents worked together with sore hands just to have the most desirable gardens and to preserve them for the next year. I could imagine my mother now, bent over and tending these same wondrous blooms in the spring and summer. She loved to garden. She had not long ago passed away, and I still used the rake and shovel set she had stowed away in the barn just to remind me of her. The handles were still shiny from the oil of her creviced hands. Every time I put them to use in the soil, I remembered her and the love of labor she had to keep our garden gate's path to the front door so beautiful. I asked my mother once as a small child, why do you work so hard to have a garden? She answered smiling down at me. Well, darling, I just want strangers who come by this way to see what kind of caring people live here. Strangers, I don't understand, I would ask her with my usual curious nature. Yes, strangers. You see, people tend to judge others like a book is judged by its cover. Never seeing the pages inside they may only get one glance this way, and that may be the only chance we ever get to prove we are a loving, kind, and welcoming family of God. Oh, I had answered with pure enlightenment. So the garden is our book cover. That, of course, stirred up my father and his strong, deep Irish laugh. It was not long after that that he christened this land Garden Gate Ranch. He said the gate to the garden led to our family's album, and once inside the rusty old iron gate, the bright red path led to pure love. I surely miss my father's laugh, as much as I missed my mother's words of wisdom while strolling through the arbors with her in our gardens. Unquestionably, they had raised me with pure love, 
my father had spoken of so warm-heartedly. With these thoughts of my dear mother and father running through my mind, I finally found my way to the large concrete water fountain, where I always made it a point to stop. I searched my jean pockets for the shiniest penny as I gave up my favorite Irish wish. The one my mother had taught me to say when we sat by the fountain waiting for the old school bus to come rumbling by each weekday. Oh, wish fairy, bring me an oh so handsome stranger, one with soothing eyes of green moss and lips of the red, red rose. Give him a gentle smile like the snapdragon and a singing voice like the cardinal. Make him dance like a butterfly and may his temperament bend like the willow. And most of all, make him fall madly in love with this Irish maiden. I laughed every time I said this, and then I tossed the shiny penny high into the air, watching the bright copper sparkle as it twirled and spun. Fast falling, it landed in the bottom of the fountain. I stopped to gaze at how many pennies lay at the bottom, most green with tarnish or moss. What a waste of money, along with the idea that I would find a perfect mate. My mother and I had been making that same wish for me for many years. But no one as of yet had struck my fancy. Of course, my father blamed my career. He had said that I needed to be more approachable. I was sure that no man would come along anytime soon, so I laughed again. Citing the large mound of pennies, Irish folklore always made for such fun in the garden. I went about with my work, and the day grew older. Just as I started cutting back the poppies, however, I heard a noise. I glanced up over the wild sunflowers that lined one of the old fence rows, and I heard the piercing noise again. It sounded like a whistle. Yes, I was sure of it now. It was a man whistling. I could see his hat over the top of my sunflower patch as he walked slowly up the gravel road. I could barely see him, but he was still moving this way. He's probably just another out of town or hiking up the mountainside. I thought, as he uh, grew closer to my gate, this man does not look familiar. I could see he was carrying something on his shoulder. He was coming from the direction of Crooked Creek's still-covered bridge. Maybe he bore a fishing pole, as the fishing in the river valley was good this time of year. I tried to act as if I did not notice his approach, as I surely was not in the mood for company, friendly or otherwise. The strange man stopped at my garden gate, and the whistle came to a halt as well. I continued to pretend not to have seen him. Excuse me, ma'am, he said softly, trying not to startle me. I was wondering if I could get a drink of water from your well. He said this pointing an extended finger towards the old well pump. I said nothing but nodded a yes and pointed to the cup sitting next to it. Thank you, ma'am. He reached inside the garden gate to unlatch it. However, the rusty old latch was broken again, and he, as he leaned over the gate to unlatch it, the gate flung wide open, hooking onto his jacket and pulling him inside with it. Worried he would fall, I got to my feet quickly. The broken gate took him by surprise. I glanced at him for only a second, then returned my gaze to the gate, watching as he reached into his faded blue denim shirt and carefully unfolded a pair of wire-rimmed glasses. What I had first taken for a fishing pole turned out to be a brass-tipped walking cane that he hung on the fence rail as he examined the broken latch. I continued to watch him curiously as he put on his glasses. Then, from a small, tightly packed knapsack, he unfolded a leatherman and selected the Phillips head screwdriver. Three hard turns of the small tool and the latch was secure once again. Returning the device to his place in the pack, the stranger slowly stood up and retrieved his cane. Dropping his glasses back into his right breast pocket, he removed his hat. For a moment, I thought he might be bald, but then I realized with the hat removed that he bore a high and tight haircut. He had a military haircut. With a quick pop of his wrist, he smacked his camouflaged boonie hat against his thigh, creating a small cloud of dust that drifted off towards my wild sunflowers. Fastened to its front was an embroidered emblem, 
embedded with two arches over a single chevron. He was a U.S. Army Staff Sergeant. Oh, I am sorry, I told him. That old gate latch has never been right. I keep meaning to fix it. And we're almost done. With my curiosity piqued, I continued watching his movements ever so closely. The look in the man's eyes was somewhat dead, yet his actions showed kindness in his heart. I knew he had came a long way, and I became curious just how much further he would travel before reaching his final destination. I walked him to the spring water pump and rinsed out the cup hanging from the cotter pin on its handle. Then I filled it to the brim with the chilled water. Not too many soldiers pass this way, I told him as he sipped the cool water. All the while, he stared at me over the rim of the old metal cup. His eyes were squinting hard against the sunlight, but I could see they were hazel green, and the charcoal scruff on his chin showed that he had not shaven in a few days. Moreover, this told me he had not seen a soft bed in a few nights either. No, ma'am, I bet not, he added. Your place is a bit off the beaten path. But when I spied the covered bridge from the main road, I took a detour to photograph it. Where are you headed for, soldier? I blurted, without thinking of how rude that question might be. Not real sure, ma'am. Maybe you can help me with that. He removed his handkerchief from his pants pocket, wiping out the tin cup. Pinned it back onto the handle of the pump. I'm well, you see, I'm looking for the Booker Ranch. Booker Ranch? I questioned. I'm afraid you took a wrong turn at the split in the road. Head south on Crooked Creek Road, and when you see the white silo, and the big gray barn deep in the valley, then you have almost landed at your destination. When you get there, there is a big sign at the drive entrance that says Circle B Ranch. You really can't miss it. I gave the directions with my strong Irish undertones and my finger pointing back and forth. And that leads us to chapter two. And this is how, what he thought about her when he met her. And my, by the way, in my book, my points of view are each their own point of view. Now, I changed that in book two, but I really wanted it to almost read like a play in book one. So you can see here where Jade speaks here, and then you can turn the page, and you can see Jade speak, and then John speak, and how they were kind of thinking about each other in that moment, in that moment of uh, that release of passion, or that moment in that release of meeting that stranger that rocks your world. You know, I really wanted that. And we will stop there. It goes on. But there you go. Now you've met my hero and my heroine, okay? But you still don't know anything about her yet. And you really don't know the deep story yet. But this is their meeting. And I just, I love, I love the location of the Montana mountains. It's my favorite place. And I would live there if I could. You see the little mountains are on the cover. I would live there if I could. But I hope you've enjoyed this chapter one reading. And I hope you learned a little something more about me. All right? So leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. And if you want to get the book, read the book it is really good you'll really like it it's not about all about war it's about their meeting and it's about their horse ride through the back mountains of montana and living cabin to cabin and trying to find her best friend big twist on the end but why is he really there you're going to have to find out in the book okay so pick up the book the gates to love and war amazon.com seven dollars i think in 99 cents they're selling it for and you i feel it really is a good book not because i wrote it but I just read you a part of it. So let me know what you think down below. If you want me to, and if you want me to read the whole book to you, and you want to read more, and you want to hear more, I can do that as well. Okay? I can do that as well. If you'd rather just do it that way, and you guys all want to say, if I get enough people that tell me they'd rather me just read it to them, and you enjoyed the read, I will read it to you. We love you. God loves you. Go with God. Blessings. Mm. Matter of fact, this is my picture of me when I was a pirate from my pirate book. <laughs> it's on my coffee mug if you can see it. Here, wait a second, I'm going to get it in here so you can laugh at me. See that? That's me in a pirate outfit. Isn't that funny?